Hey, Renan. Good to see you. Good to see you as well, my friend. Thanks for bearing with me uh, time-wise. I know I feel like we like rescheduled it a number of times and then I'm late today, so it's all fun. It's all good. This is, I mean, we're not working a nine to five lifestyle. So if things go a little bit this way or that way, no problem. It, it doesn't interfere with anybody's life. No, 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 for sure. But especially this past month, I've just been kind of like running at like the speed as can be of too many things at once and traveling to everything. So my brain is also like very mushy these days. Yes. Now, just we're doing a rolling start. So this is the Cash Room Connections podcast. I'm John Caprani. And my guest today is Mr. Renan Rosenbaum, who is uh, in Amsterdam today, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Home base is here in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where it's cold and rainy in the middle of July. And you are somebody who every time I see you on Facebook, you appear to be in a different city at a different conference. So what is it that you do that um, enables that kind of lifestyle? Uh, I think part of it is just good luck. Uh, you know, I kind of, uh, let's say, got very lucky when I came over to Kandago, um, just because it was the right time and the right place for a lot of things. But you know, we scale brands on paid media. Um, we really build brands, um, very brand focused, uh, very strong um, spokesperson driven brands, all sorts of other things. But for us, there's always new opportunities um, of expanding. There's always new offers coming out every week. There's always new players in the game, new people to meet. So it's important for me running BizDev to really be at every possible location I can get to where... I can connect with people. Uh, you know, I take a lot of calls during the week and connect with a lot of people, but it's very different in person. Uh, there's a lot more that can happen there. So I really go to a variety of different events. And again, I think I'm just kind of lucky uh, because they're not really such bad to look at places. Uh, you know, I got to go to Con Lion in uh, the Creative Festival in Con France. And I mean, it was just like the French Riviera right there in my face, but I'm there for work, you know? And, um, you know, not to mention that I'm going to like events where like Lenny Kravitz is performing and like five feet away from me. And I'm like, how is this happening? Uh, so there's that. Or like I went uh, in May to a meta invite only conference in Cyprus. Um, and again, like what is a bad backdrop when you're in Cyprus? Um, this past month, I was affiliate expo in Milan. So again, opportunity to see Italy. So yeah. it's really going for business. Yeah. But it just happened. really Tristan, Tristan and I have been to make me jealous now. <laughs> it just happened to be a very lucky, nice thing that I'm afforded this luxury of getting to represent a company where the locations are that. You know, I worked in other industries in the past where you kind of uh, get stuck going to the same trade shows in the same place every year and they mm -hmm. get a little monotonous and old. You know, it's not, it can be great for business, but from like a personal perspective, you're not necessarily having fun. Um, whereas, I get to combine the two uh, because I get to go to all these cool locations. And part of the nature of our business is always finding something new and exciting that maybe hasn't fully been discovered, um, which means that it's really important for me to diversify events. So a lot of the times I don't go to the same event two years in a row. So it's a really cool luxury to have to say, oh, where to next? Um, because in a sense, that's kind of what's going on is just like looking at what's new and exciting out there. Um, you know, I went to Con Lions uh, for the first time this year, and that is a really wild and interesting and cool event of so much from like a creative standpoint. Um, but it's not something, you know, prior to working with Kandago, it's not even something that would have been on my radar in terms of our industry or things like that. So a lot of the luxury um, is very much attached to the brand and who I represent, um, just because our needs are a little bit different than other people in the space. So it's important for me to diversify and go to different things. Got you. Okay. So this is, I'm taking notes, by the way, while you talk. So I'm cool. kind of, because it's hard, you know, to... um to piece together everything everybody's saying. So I just write down quickly the things that stand out and then I return back to them. So if you just see me looking down, that's what I'm doing. Not my mobile no, phone, no, no, I you're promise. Totally good. This is easy <laughs> and fun. So I'm here um, for the next hour. Just let me know uh, anything you want to talk about. It's good. Great. So I guess the first thing is um, you about what you do. You talked about Candego and it's interesting how you described it. Like your one sentence Summary is we build brands on paid media. 
which rather than we scale traffic on paid media, which is what you would typically hear from a paid media agency. So do you want to talk about that distinction and what it means for yeah. the companies you work with? Um, well, and it's good that you mentioned agency just because kind of one of the biggest um, kind of education elements of uh, like for me when I'm targeting new clients or talking to anyone in the space is explain that we're not an agency. We're really like one step further, but we're a long-term solution. So we work strategically with partners to scale them in a stable way. So for example, I'll tell you that my top 10 campaigns are all doing over 2000 sales a day. That's not one month on, one month off or having moments. You know, if we're if we're running low um, in terms of uh, fulfillment on a specific campaign that we're working on, if we're even 50 sales less than the week before, there's an internal effort to adjust that, to make things different um, because we're not just chasing kind of um, the trends in terms of like what offers going hot this year, or, um, this month or this quarter or something like that. We really build brands in a long-term way. So for example, in addition to buying the traffic, we also have in-house production and creative. So, you know, it depends from client to client what's necessary and what's needed. But for example, if you have an amazing skincare brand and you have all these different resources that are wonderful, but you don't have, you know, proper testimonials and user-generated content, we will do that for you. If, you know, if you're funnel is performing really well, but maybe the AOV isn't where it needs to be, we'll optimize, um, we might even rewrite your entire upsell downsell flow. If there's an opportunity for a JV with a, um, you know, like-minded complementary product, um, maybe another client of ours will help set that up as well. We'll do everything to make sure that it's a win-win, but that you're profitable as the offer owner. So, there's so many different things that come into that. We also offer CRO, so we're able to really split test things. We, uh, Any of our clients working with CRO, we're looking at generally a six-month timeline in terms of what we're going to be testing and what's going on. So there's a lot of different aspects to that. Um, anyone working with us has a minimum, I'd say, of 10 to 12 people internally working on their campaign day in and day out. Um, and there's so many different things that come to that. We have a compliance team in-house. So even though we've been around for 17 years and we've never had one ad account shut down, banned or restricted, we've never even had a campaign rejected. Um, we still have a really robust internal compliance team um, because it's important for us that anything we touch is compliant, essentially. Um, we have a team of copywriters in-house that do a number of things from helping our clients, you know, optimize their funnels to write new copy to whatever's needed. So there's so many different aspects to what we do and how we do. And the big kind of game changer I'd say with us is the stability. Most of our clients we're working with upwards of five, six years. Um, I have three scaled campaigns that we're working with for over seven years. Um, that's not typical in the space. That's not something that I know other people doing. Um, and, you know, the similar to anywhere else, there are times that things run dry. So there may be a month that Facebook isn't working for us the same as it was last month. Um, but we operate in terms of solutions. So if something's happening that's affecting traffic, we find ways to compensate. So we brought a lot of celebrities to different um, funnels that we work on. We brought, you know, new doctors for endorsements or whatever's needed. You know, we get creative um, because that's the name of the game, you know, for us, our reputation is out there. It's very well known that we deliver, you know, scale and volume in a stable form. Um, it's important for us to kind of keep it up there. So we're always working to do that. So to answer your question in a very long winded way, um, there's just a number of different things that we offer, um, our clients that goes well beyond, uh, buying traffic. Got us. Okay. So the I guess the thing with the, you said about scaling in a stable way is kind of counter to the way a lot of marketers think, which is find a hot offer, like scale up the traffic as quick as you can, run that offer until it starts to fatigue and then sort of shut down and create a new offer. The way I've heard it described by some people in the business is that it's more like uh, event promotions than corporate business. In a sense, yes. In a sense, yes. <laughs> So what actually brings a person to the point where they say, hey, you know what, you 
chasing offers isn't working for me anymore. I need to do things in a different way and brings them to your door. Um, well, I think it depends. It's not always um, that kind of transition, let's say, you know, I think there's a lot of space for a lot of things. So for instance, that more, let's say, let's call it like the churn and burn aspect to the space. Um, I think there's a space for that. I don't think it's necessarily just because it's not what we're doing doesn't make it wrong, doesn't make mm -hmm. it a different space. Um, in terms of working with us, it really depends because I get people at all different levels, let's say. Sometimes it's too early an entry point. The offer's not proven. There's still a lot of data that needs to be found. Sometimes, you know, the offer is very interesting, but, you know, they're not able to, you know, pay a proper CPA, for example, or something. You know, there's a lot of different things. Someone comes to me and they could be, you know, scaling the offer to the moon on Facebook. It could be amazing. But if they're not monetizing their back end, we know in the big picture they're going to lose money and it's not going to be something that's going to build a business. So we look at, let's say, like all aspects. And I wouldn't say like any two uh, avatars are the same. It's a lot of different things that kind of go into place. Um, what I would say the most important aspect of someone coming to want to work with us is that they understand that it's not plug and play, that there's a collaboration aspect to it. Um, you know, we don't just take a link, make our own creative, say, have a good day. It's not the way we operate. We do regular calls with our clients. We plan things out. We strategize. If it's a, you know, strong spokesperson driven brand, um, we might deliver the copy for, you know, certain creatives and ads that they do, but they still need to film it. You know, um, a lot of times clients uh, have, let's say, unedited raw content that we have the best video editors in the game. We'll put it all together, um, but they need to deliver that to us. And it sounds simple and it sounds easy, but not every partner is, you know, not every person is willing to kind of put their skin in the game. If I look at some of our, you know, top campaigns, if you want to look at like V Shred, for example, I mean, those people are working hard every day. It's not something where, you know, we're handling the media. I mean, they do a certain percentage internally as well, but, you know, we're working with their teams to get somewhere. And so anytime someone comes to my doorstep, let's say, and they're willing to work and they see how much has to go into it, even if it's not the right fit today, I always keep an eye on what they're doing and try to see because it could be something next month because I'm really looking for people that, have their head in the game, are really looking to grow something and understand the work that goes into it day to day. Because my top scaled campaigns that are running over, you know, five, six years, they're not just sitting there. There's constant daily work that's going into it on both ends, both on ours and the brand side. So when you talked about, you know, scaling up, up a brand, uh, you're thinking then of the vision of where the brand can go to. And Absolutely. Where, where can a brand go to when you like if you push it as far as it can go on paid media, what, what directions can a brand go to grow further beyond that? I think there's a lot of different ways. First off, you can just have a super successful brand where you're making a ton of money. You have a community based around the brand. You have a really profitable, you know, either email lists or segmented different email lists. And you're finding ways to basically make money in all different aspects of the funnel. And that can be great. But a lot of times the next step is taking to do new markets. You know, we have multiple clients that we've taken into both Latin America and Spanish speaking U.S. These are really, really, really strong markets. Um, I would say almost just as strong as the U.S. And it's a major opportunity for a brand that's doing well in the U.S. market to take them there. We've seen um, great success with a number of different brands doing that. Um, there's also other geos. We've taken brands to the UK, to Germany. Um, you know, there's a lot of different places to extend a brand when there's given success in one market. So that's one. Um, another thing is obviously growing additional, like let's say subset brands. So if you are a strong brand with either a really strong message or you have a really great spokesperson, then there can easily be other avenues to build out um, corresponding products. You know, maybe it's a nutrition funnel, then it makes sense to do a fitness funnel, you know, attach to that. Uh, I, there are a lot of different ways to kind of continue to grow, but it's really planning things out for 
the big picture. It's not ripping someone's page, uh, just, you know, uh, kind of like running at whatever you think sticks, like kind of like what you were talking about before in terms of uh, kind of event promotion. It's not like that. It's really building a long-term brand and having those, um, I'd say some of those ideas in the forefront um, from an early stage, even if we're not going to go into new markets for the next two years, it's good to know that that's a goal, that that's something that you're open and looking to do. And you specifically are, you, you describe yourself as business development. Is that is that your like your official role or title within the business? Yeah, I, I think I've become, let's say, a bit of a gatekeeper um, for the company, which I like, um, which is very cool. Uh, so I get a chance to speak to a lot of kind of front facing things that come our way, whether it's um, dealing with celebrity presenters, uh, you know, hiring new staff internally, um, you know, external additional product and projects that we work on. Um, as well as new business, but it could also be looking for opportunities within current business. So it really, I always was um, saw business development um, very much, uh, much more in almost an account management kind of way um, with, let's say, a little bit of hunting in there. Um, the role I have, especially for my crazy ADHD brain, is pretty incredible because there's never two days where I'm just doing the exact same thing. There's always something new. There's always something that I didn't realize was even something that I would ever be doing, um, which is cool. You know, talking to, uh, you know, all these different A-list uh, celebrities, agents and celebrities on calls and, you know, negotiating things for clients. It's a cool, fun thing that um, I just didn't think of when I got into performance marketing. So you almost have your hands in in lots of different parts of the business that you're working in and then you also have your hand in different parts of your clients businesses too yeah i get um i get a lot of different handles of the business i guess you could say i get to see it from all angles which is very cool to me just because it also gives you a lot more information and keeps you a little more educated in terms of what the needs are, because since we're a unique company, we don't just test offers. We don't just run traffic. Um, we do a very full, healthy audit process with anyone before we onboard them. And we look at, is this something we could be running in a year? Um, what, you know, what do we see from it? What are our goals? What are our objectives? And when you get to see things from multiple angles, I think you have a better a pulse, let's say, on what's going to work for us and what the needs are in terms of the next great campaign or the next project. That's really interesting. You talked about your goals and objectives as a company. You have to look at potential new clients and how do they fit into that. So where, what are those goals and objectives for you as an organization and, and how do you set those? Well, I mean, I think for us is just because we're already, let's say, at the top in terms of what we're doing, in terms of traffic, in terms of, you know, kind of the presence we um, set in the space. We do a lot of things first. We do a lot of things best. Um, we kind of got to keep things there. So part of it is, of course, you know, the biggest name of the game with um, Kindago is really adaptation. We're a company that adapts. If there's a new compliance nightmare coming down, you know, the headway, uh, we get in front of it and we make adjustments. We don't, you know, wait until someone's going to come cracking down. If there is a new industry trend that's working everywhere that we've never done before, uh, we need to jump on that right away. Whatever's needed to keep the ball moving so that we can continue to grow. Um, we're in a very healthy state of growth right now. And with that comes opportunities that, maybe weren't always there before. So we get to um, explore a lot of new um, verticals and spaces. Uh, for me, it's been very exciting. We've gone um, into like the telemedicine space, for example, and there's so many different intricacies, even just with supply chain and legality in the US in terms of doctor's prescriptions and having everything set for scale. And it's been fascinating for me to kind of learn this space and start to understand it. Um, and that wasn't something that we were focused on two years ago when I started with the company. Um, similarly, you know, there's a focus now on things in the Spanish and, you know, Latin American market. And that's very interesting because it was just 
I don't want to say a pipe dream, but it was something we were just getting started on two years ago. And now it's something that we're heavily exploring. So it's kind of as we grow and kind of perfect certain things, we kind of move along with that. Like, for example, we've really um, been growing our relationships with TikTok and Snapchat in the last two years, but it wasn't always a driving force of traffic for us. And now they're both really great avenues. So it becomes a huge benefit when I'm bringing new business in, the fact that we can run things at scale on Snapchat, the fact that we do things on CTV through YouTube, um, the fact that we do things on TikTok. These aren't things that everyone can speak to. So it brings new opportunities in the door as well. So this is like when you get to the size you're at, is that you're not just going to the ads manager, you're picking up the phone and you've got an inside connection and relationships built in with people in those companies and actually can sort of intro your clients in a concierge type of way. Yeah, it's a bit different. You know, we've been around for 17 years and we've grown those relationships. So, you know, 17 years to most people in the space really is like dinosaur years. Um, and, you know, we have direct relationships with all the networks. Um, you know, we are on regular talks, but I can, you know, easily reach out, whether it's Google or Facebook or YouTube or Snapchat or TikTok. Um, I get to go to a lot of these invite only um, events that are specifically just for their top partners. Those relationships go a really long way. Having those direct relationships is a major game changer in terms of, just making things happen like we run things all compliantly so it's not like we're getting like backside like favors to do something um, non-compliant or not right um but there is a very big difference you know when a client comes to us and they've had their youtube turned off or their facebook shut down we can overturn that so it's one of those things you know it's not a service that we sell i don't just i can't just do that for everyone because i get a lot of requests for it so that's why i mention it but you know, we can help our clients in a lot of ways because of those relationships. There's a lot, there's a lot built there. Do you find that your role in business development sort of, um, sort of stretches over into sales at times, or do you focus primarily on the relationship and leave the sales to others? Um, I go into everything. I have a little bit, you know, I'm very lucky with Kendago because for such a top company doing so much, they extend a lot of trust to me and they, you know, give me a lot of power, let's say, to help move the needle. I'm involved in many high level chats and things going on. Um, so it's exciting to me. Um, but with that, there's always different, you know, if there's, um, I don't know, I'm just using this for an example, but if there's like an internal need for someone, let's say on like the video editing team and there needs to be a new video editor, uh, I get involved to help bring that person in. That's not something you would think of specifically for biz dev, um, but it is for me within the role. So I'd say I'm involved with most aspects of the business. I wouldn't say I'm the driving force on everything, but I'm very um, well involved in as much as I need to be. You spoke about the idea of needing to find something new and exciting at all times. And for that reason, you want to go to a different diversify event. So you talked about things like CanLine, which is something that's pretty much outside of the kind of paid media direct response space. So you're looking for different areas of industries where you can find ideas from? Are you looking to create new relationships in different in different industries that you can do partnerships with? Or what's your thought process? Um, well, I always look at a lot of different things. So for example, I connected at Conline with a lot of really great B2B um, agencies uh, that do a lot of things in terms of um, like promotional placement. So like one thing we'll do for clients is let's say they need to get on Good Morning America will help make that happen. You know, if there's certain podcasts they want to get on, we'll do things like that. So it's always good for me to kind of expand my network and my repertoire in terms of who can help make certain things happen because there isn't a one-stop shop for those needs. You know, one company or, you know, one agent might be able to get you placements on X, Y, and Z, and then someone else can do A, B, and C. And there are different things you kind of have to have those resources. So 
that's one aspect to it. Um, there's also a major aspect um, at these events of scaled brands that are very, very interesting that are actually doing direct response style marketing, but are not at all involved with the direct response community. Um, they really don't go to any affiliate shows. Um, and so it's still things that are very, let's say, relevant to us, but not always as easily accessible as certain things that you or I may know in the space. Oh, so that's almost the opposite where there's companies that are already big and established and they see that there's a gap for them in, in paid media and actually moving more of their business online. No, no, no. Um, what I mean is, for example, um, there's a, a big brand that we work with that's based out of Lithuania that does massive scale in terms yeah. of um, sales on a daily basis. And they do all direct response style marketing. They do, you know, essentially anything that you would expect. They have VSLs, they have all these things, but they have never been to a US show before. Um, they're not in the direct response Facebook group. They're not really known by people in the space. They run a different business. Um, direct response in terms of the marketing um, is something that I've seen many people outside the space use you know it's a way of connecting with the end consumer with these d to c campaigns um you know we're really lucky that we have this community and all of these people in direct response um but there are a lot of businesses out there using direct response marketing that are very very relevant but not let's say in the space if that makes sense yes so I'm also always looking for those opportunities. And additionally, there's sometimes opportunities for companies that have an online presence, but maybe have never tried direct response style marketing to come in and either be supplemental or drive a new chain of business for them. Is bringing your brands to retail still a big priority these days or not so much? Does it not matter as much because online has taken so much market share? I mean, we focus on D2C. <laughs> So there are a few brands that we work with that have retail presences, but it's not really something we're trying to move towards or something that is really, I, I would say it's not even really that much of an aspect of our business. You know, if it's something that has a strong retail presence already that can help with driving online sales, that can be interesting. Um, but we're not really necessarily looking for something that has a retail presence. It's not a bad thing, but it's also not a perk, let's say. Okay. When it comes to actually the brands you work with, I mean, apart from the fact that you are able to help these, these companies to scale, as you said, in a stable way and have this very long-term multi-year outlook, what other elements do you find actually give a brand longevity and enable it to be able to survive through trends and market changes over time? I think the most important thing, and it's uh, sometimes hard to put into words, it's a little bit of like a je ne sais quoi, but it's it's something special. It's something unique. If there's something really, you know, like what we excel in better than most is video creatives. And we do all sorts of different direct response style video creatives for brands, but there's a lot that you can do with a unique brand. So for example, I'm not running any, you know, white label supplements. Again, nothing wrong with that space. It's just not something in the way that we we build brands. We're not just scaling campaigns. So for us, if there's something really unique and special, um there uh, you know, if it's a I don't know, a skincare product, um, there should be something really unique in the formula um, or there should be something really unique in the selling pattern or the actual product itself, the application, or there should be a really strong and unique uh, spokesperson. Uh, there's a lot of different um, things that can make an offer, make a brand really unique, but there should be something proprietary. I'm not talking necessarily with a patent, but something that really gives you that kind of competitive advantage when it comes to promotion to really make something special. It's good. Um, when it comes to the people, and then you, because you talked about the vetting process as well, what are you looking out for in people that you think, hey, these people could be a great client, these could be a great strategic partner, or this could just be good talent to bring into our own business? 
Um, for me, it's really important. Um, I know I said this before, but it's someone who's kind of hungry and willing to work, someone who I see the drive that they're not, you know, I can kind of pick up and I'm not saying it means we won't explore the opportunity, but I can pick up early on if the person doesn't want to do any work. You know, there can be a really great conversation that goes really far. And then I have, you know, a number of follow up questions, um, depending on how they answer and what they're sharing. It can show me a lot. It can tell me a lot. Um, I'm looking for someone who really wants to work with us. You know, there have been multiple campaigns that we've onboarded that we said no to at first for a number of reasons. Maybe the spend or the data, there wasn't enough. Maybe they needed to you know, figure things out with their back end because they were losing money on the front. Um, you know, there could be a number of different things that maybe make an offer not ready today. And it's tough sometimes because you deal with egos and, you know, people in general, you know, if you're proud of your business and you're doing eight figures and I tell you the answer is no, it can sting. And it's not necessarily because there's anything wrong with your business, but maybe it's not the right fit for us. Maybe we don't feel we can add value. Maybe it's just a no for now. I never say a hard no forever because things can change. I will tell you that I personally get a little more excited and a little more skin in the game wanting to work with them when people come back after the no, when people show me any form of improvement. It doesn't even have to be grandiose. It could be, I had someone who we turned down um, and they came back with 2K more a day campaign spend, which in the scale of what we're doing in big picture isn't so much. But the fact that they came back and were showing me the changes they made and how things have been going for a month and that they really showed a dedication to want to work with us, that got me very excited about these are partners I want to work with because it shows me that they understand the game. They understand what's necessary. Um, and it's really not personal. I work for a very nice company that you know treats all of our clients equally well and is really good internally to employees and this and that, but we're also a performance-based marketing, you know, company that for our main model of the partner model, we actually fund the campaigns for our clients. So I have multiple clients where we're doing over seven figures a day campaign spend and Kandago is covering all of that. There's a lot of perks to working with us. And when I see someone ably and you know maybe not aggressively but really proactively putting in the effort to show us that they want to be um a strong partner that kind of shows me what i need to know in terms of them so it, it's the willingness to listen and the willingness to actually take the feedback on and then pursue growth for sure because i wouldn't say that kendago knows everything but what we do know we know very well you know, we've been doing this for a long time. So for example, if someone comes to me with something on the email side, even though we know a lot about email, I've worked in email for years, Kendago doesn't touch email. So it's not something that I would say in terms of, you know, we can connect you with the right people and do a lot of things and we understand the space, but I wouldn't say we're the experts in it, you know, but if it, you're coming to us in terms of Facebook and you have, let's say like... I don't know, let's say you have a nutritional campaign. Well, that's something that we do extremely well in. I'm not saying you have to take everything, you know, point blank as fact and not have any of your own thoughts or opinions. Um, like we strategize and discuss things together, but there's definitely a lot of value in Kandago's insight in that space. Yes. Um, that's a, a standout differentiator as well. This this is the thing of, of actually funding the campaigns because that's something where, well, it's a kind of, it's a big brass balls kind of move for any, any person running campaigns to do is to actually take on that rate, that risk. It, there's a lot to it. So you really have to have a deep belief and trust in the relationship before you can do that with somebody. A hundred percent. And you have to keep in mind, <laughs> not just the straight dollars on the campaign spend. I mean, that can go high, but you also have to think about the resources of allocating people internally, um, depending on, the product there may need more in terms of, you know, research and development. There may need more from the creative side. You know, if you have like a really great funnel that could be amazing for us and a brand that we could do so much with, but you don't have any, let's say, you know, current assets uh, promoting any form of like UGC or any kind of like user testimonials, that's a big, you know, up burden on our end uh, to kind of shoulder. So, 
it really, it depends on the client, but it's a lot more than just campaign spend in terms of what we're investing. We're really investing in the brand and feeling that it's something, um, there's no guarantee, but we don't onboard anything that we don't feel like we'll still be running in a year and the plan is to be running it at least three. So uh, again, there's no guarantee. Sometimes things don't work out, but that's really part of our audit process is really feeling like this is a brand that we're able to invest in and see long-term growth with. So this is hence the need for a lot of like creative assets and marketing assets that can actually be deployed quickly and actually be used to, to grow that because it's not just spending the money. It's about having things to put in front of people's eyeballs as well, right? Exactly, exactly. And there are things, um, you know, you can't just, an affiliate manager isn't going to necessarily be enough in terms of communication with us. Um, so if there is, uh, you know, if there are certain needs um, from a creative aspect that needs to be done by the client, it's really important that they have a point person or someone in place who can manage those tasks and work with our team on things and understand what's going on. There's a lot um, more intricacies because if we're utilizing CRO for a client, there's a number of different ad creatives that get added into the mix and things get planned out and there's a strategy and it's a lot more complex than just, you know, here's some swipes from my offer. So it's one of these things where, again, it really comes down in a lot of ways to the partner um, and making sure one thing that I've learned really well from Kindago and I respect the company so much for this is Every deal has to be a win-win. It can't be something where we make money and it doesn't work for the client or vice versa. It needs to be something that we're both backing out really well from because that's what's going to build the long-term relationship. And usually now I start these calls um, speaking to the person about the person, but you know, you're in kind of a unique position. So we've spoke for most of this call so far about what you do in the in the business you're in right now. But as for you personally, I mean, um, where did you start out in marketing? How did you find your way into this industry? Um, I've always been a sales guy. I've always been great with biz dev. Um, in a prior life, I'm a gemologist. So I worked with, with uh, diamonds and gemstones. Uh, I did both on the high-end luxury um, wholesale side as well as the high-end luxury retail side. I worked on Rodeo Drive for a number of years. Um, selling diamonds to celebrities. Um, and I always had a, let's say, a spe special gift for sales and kind of like long-term strategy from a biz dev perspective. But I really fell into um, this space. I started, uh, part of it was living in the Netherlands and uh, what could I do legally for work and what was there. And not speaking Dutch um, was really let's say an obstacle for a lot of entry level um, positions. Um, and I got a position with um, a payment processor who did high risk. So essentially all adult or porn um, doing a uh, basically biz dev and sales for them. And I, you know, in that space, you have these kind of members only back ends where people will share affiliate links, but those you know, affiliate sales are close to nothing and it's not really affiliate marketing in any way. And I got recruited by a company in affiliate marketing and went to an interview where I sounded like such an idiot um, because I was talking about what I know about affiliate marketing, not understanding that I didn't even know what I was saying. Um, uh, but they liked something in me and I ran the acquisitions department, built it out for them, all new business, um, really got a lay of the land. Um, and in that space, I was working on, let's say, the dark side, um, adult dating, uh, sweepstakes, things that I don't really necessarily um, want to be involved with um, anymore. Um, and I kind of stumbled into direct response by accident. Um, I had a friend in the space who was an offer owner. Uh, who had a few direct response offers and was um, somewhat connected in the community. And I started working for him and I really gave it a very hard push in the beginning for a long time because I didn't understand, like I didn't understand these email creatives, these swipes. I thought like, looks like your grandmother could do it. Um, I'm like, what am I looking <laughs> at? Like, because I was used to the scammier side of the space, which is all copying like a brand Nike and these kind of things in a very clean, polished way. 
Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand direct response at all. And it wasn't until I started seeing the sales coming through, I was like, oh, crap, this actually works. So it took a few months of me kind of like pushing back to fully understand. And then from there, I just got much deeper in direct response and realized how much I like the space because I find that there's a certain level of integrity within the space that isn't maybe in all of performance marketing, um, you know, I've kind of moved more and more to the cleaner compliance side over the years. So working for Kandago is really great because I work for a lot of brands that actually help people and do a lot of good things. And there's nothing scammy about anything that we run. Um, so that's really promising and exciting for me in terms of how my career um, kind of goes. And I think the marketing aspect was always important for me, but I will say that I kind of eat, breathe, and sleep paid media now, and that's really all from Kandago. Um, I mean, I spent the first, I would say, first six months on the job with my boss, Adam Feldman, who's VP of BizDev, and really built so much of the company um, in terms of where we're at now. Uh, he spent like three hours a day just drilling every fact he knew into my head, telling me everything that he knew. He invested a lot of time and energy, and it's been kind of, let's say, a fast track um, growth within paid media because I get to learn from the best. So you were you were hired primarily then for your attitude rather than pre-existing experience. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I I had experience working with, uh, you know, different forms of media buyers and affiliates that were doing paid media, but they were running more of those kind of event promotions, as you said, um, they had very highs and very lows, and I never really got to see inside their business. So, I mean, everything I know in terms of paid media really has come from Kandago. There have been things that I've, let's say, learned outside of Kandago, but at like an event that Kandago is sending me to. So it's still very much within the vein, you know, when you're going to an invite only meta conference and learning things at a very high level with, um, you know, a very select group of top players um, in terms of meta, there's, I mean, like, I'm a sponge. If you want to give me information, I want to take it. So there's been a lot of incredible opportunities afforded to me since I started with Kandago. Amazing. And you, you're you originally from the US. You now live in the Netherlands. And you're working with a team that's pretty much all over the world at this point, right? Well, the majority of our team is based in Israel. There are uh, a couple handfuls of us spread out like myself, but most everyone's in Israel um, themselves, but I'm dealing with clients all over. So there are clients in Israel, there are clients in the US, there are clients um, throughout Europe, there are clients, you know, in all different places. So it really... I mean, I always say if I'm awake, I'm generally online. Um, there's always something going on. Uh, so it's all different time zones. Are you ever able to switch off and unplug? Do you find it hard to disconnect? Um, well, I find it easy to kind of like snap in and snap out. So like, for instance, if like I go out to dinner with friends tonight or like I like to cook a lot, so I might have people over and cook a very decadent meal. Mm -hmm. um, if I see a really important message right beforehand, I mean, right before our um, call today, I got an email. I'm in the middle of uh, contract negotiations with a very um, promising big new client. Um, and they had, we've been going back and forth with contracts for the last couple of weeks just to make everything right. And they had a request that took five minutes of putting my brain hat on and getting into it. And that's why I was a little uh, later to the call today. So it's, I'm good at switching on and off. I always take breaks when I need to. I listen to myself. I'm a workaholic, but I was saying this to someone yesterday. I have the luxury that if I wanted to take today off, not saying that I don't have work and things to do, but if I woke up and had a crummy day, I have all the power to do that. So that's a very, let's say, liberating feeling for me in this space because it's number one, not something everyone in the space has. Um, you know, I I have a boss that knows that I work like 15 plus hours a day, but he never pushes me harder. He always says, you need to take a break. You need to, you know, I don't want you to get burnt out. I want you to be able to be here. So for me, I'm just by nature a bit of a workaholic. I took off uh, about two weeks for my birthday this year um, and did limited amounts of work, but went to France and didn't bring my laptop, which was huge. But 
I'm still playing a game of catch up today. So, and okay. I've been back for over a week and a half. So it's one of those things where I, but that was also my first vacation in five years. So, uh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit of a crazy person. What can I say? You know, <laughs> I also see that you, um, you actually like invite like friends and colleagues and people to your, to your place in, in Amsterdam, right? You have friends like visit internationally or come to your house for dinner and you'll cook for people. I mean, I really like to cook for people. Um, it's something that I feel I discovered my, let's say, my talent for cooking later in life. Um, it wasn't something I always uh, felt comfortable in the kitchen. Um, and it's kind of giving a piece of my heart. So when friends come to town, if they want to, or they're open, I love to have people over and make a nice meal because it's just something I can, you know, that I can give of myself. Yeah. I, I don't do it enough and I want to do it more. But when you cook for people and you make them smile, it's a great feeling and it really cements a friendship. Yeah, I'm just a really big um, fan and proponent of uh, of having people in my space. Like I like to host people. I like to be able to share things. If people come to the city, um, I like to be able to take them out, show them a little bit of Amsterdam, things like that, you know. Outside of the weather, I'm very proud of my city. It's cool. Yeah, I haven't visited in such a long time. I've visited the Netherlands twice, and I, I really enjoyed it both times. In the summer, haven't been there in the winter. I'm guessing it's pretty well, tough. I, listen, we're in 16th of July, and I um, I went for a haircut um, this morning. And uh, on the way out, the skies just opened up pouring for about 30 minutes. And I came home drenched before a call, just like everything running down my face. And I thought like... Oh, this is lovely. And it's freezing rain, by the way. And it's the 16th of July. Yeah. The Northern Europe. I mean, it's kind of like that in Ireland here, too. From what I understand, I've never actually been to Ireland and it's on my list. Um, but from what I understand, it's very similar to here. Like it's always raining. Correct. It, it's very much. Yeah. It's real Northern Europe. This is why we're moving in a few weeks. We're moving down to Spain in a, in on the, moving into our new place on the 1st of September. That's amazing. Congrats. And oh, you're going to love sunshine. Where in Spain, by the way? We're going to a place called Gandia, which is just about 50 kilometers south of Valencia. It's along that coast. So we're right on the beach looking I at the love sea. Valencia, and I love the beach or anything with water. It's for me, I'm very attracted to places with water. It's a very cooling presence for me. Um, I think it's why Amsterdam really spoke to me. Um, we're below sea level and there's water everywhere you turn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but oh wow, Spain sounds amazing. Yeah, it's, it's been a dream for a while. We used to live in Fiji and we were very close to the to the ocean there. And in Ireland, we've been living inland. It's lovely. It's sheep and cows, but I just I would really like to see the sea more often. So we're making that move in a few weeks' time. The sea and the sunshine. Yeah, that too. I think that makes a big difference. Last my wife is from Fiji, so last winter she's just like, I'm not doing this again. Next summer, we have to get something happening. We need to change. I was like, you're right. Let's do it. I understand her. I spent a decade in California, and I think it really thinned out my blood. And I just don't do well in the cold. As soon as it's, I'm just, I'm so sad when it gets cold here. Yes. Well, it's what, I guess, what you do with the fact you get to travel so much is actually a perfect fit for for you and it's, it's very lucky like this winter i was in dubai and cabo and cyprus and all these like beautifully warm places where do you see actually things are moving towards because it, i've noticed the last couple of years there seems to be more and more people like doing business in dubai or running their business out of dubai is a lot of the industry you work in going more in that direction or is it still primarily u.s centric um, I think it depends on kind of where the business is at and kind of also how big the business is. I mean, I think Dubai really serves a solution for a lot of, you know, bigger offer owners because there are ways to basically, you know, avoid taxes um, by moving your business there or integrating there. So it can be very profitable for people. Um, I think, you know, the consensus with everyone I know going there is really specifically for basically making more money. So. I love Dubai when I visited. I think it's gorgeous. It's super lush. Um, I like anything kind of glamorous. Like I just love being in the French Riviera. So being in Dubai, there was some really nice things. But I don't think 
to my understanding, people are, you know, just setting up businesses and moving there because the weather is nice. It's a lot more about the tax write-offs and, you know, being able to make more money. Mm -hmm. um, am I right, though, maybe that still, when it comes down to it, like a real scalability that the United States market is still the kind of core and the place to be? Yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of big things happening in other markets as well, but I would say like the concentrated, let's say like vibe or focus of a lot of businesses is US. Like, um, you know, there's a lot of these big kind of, as I mentioned, direct response companies that are based out of Lithuania, for example. Um, but even if they're running in multiple markets, US is their strongest focus. Um, so I think that they're there are a lot of big businesses outside of us but if you're talking a more of like a granular scale i think that the us really is one of the biggest markets in general I, well, i've just personally found anyway that for my own work that working with people from the us is attitudinally their their focus is always on growth and they tend to have just a sort of certain up type of optimism that you don't really find anywhere else yeah, I think it really, I feel like there's so many different, like, colorful people from all over that it's so, you know, I do a lot of business, for instance, with a lot of different people in Israel, and I find them to be really, like, on top of everything they're doing, especially, like, the ad platforms in, uh, you know, I have a number of different, like, German clients and friends in the space who are, like, very on top of what's going on and, like, really, like, you know, in there. And then there are people who... But I think it's from anywhere. Some people are just, I think, more motivated um, because with the U.S., uh, you know, those are my people and that's where I come from. But there's so many insanely hard workers that I find everywhere. So it just, um, yeah, I think it just depends. Okay. But um, if people want to find you and get in touch with you, where's the best place to do it? Um, well, just my name at Kandago.com is a great email. Uh, just Renan at Kandago.com. Mm -hmm. um, find me on Instagram. It's just Renan, my name, like it's spelled here on the Zoom, but R-A-A-N-A-N-L-R. -A -A um, or connect with me on LinkedIn, Renan Rosenbaum, um, or my Skype. And my ID is the same on Skype as with uh, Instagram. It's just Renan L-R. Well, I'm going to put all those in the video description when we publish on YouTube. And oh, thank you so much for taking the time to come here today. Any final thoughts before we wrap? Um, no, I think this was just really great. You know, I think that you have really become such a trusted major name in the space for copy. I really um, respect what you do. I respect how you built um, a name for yourself. I know so many different copywriters that come through your kind of mentorship and things like that, that I think you just add a lot to the space. And I think overall, you're just a really great, nice guy. So I'm really happy to uh, that you extended the invitation to me and that I got to spend the last hour with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And stop the recording now.